Matthew chapter 6 in your Bibles. The last few weeks, as I mentioned, we've been looking at this topic of prayer. And real quick, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here like I usually do. We're going to go quick. But we answered the first week of why don't we pray. And we studied how when we, we don't pray because we lack desire. We're, we're either not saved, we're not a really a true believer of Jesus Christ, so there's no desire. Or we're so full of our selfishness that we just get so caught up in our own ways and the things of life that we never take the time to pray. We looked out, we lack faith. We don't truly believe that God can answer, that God can work in our lives. That may be good for other people, but that's, that doesn't work for me. Or we lack endurance. We have no spiritual or mental discipline and we quit. Next week, we answered the question, why should we pray? And we looked at how prayer draws us closer to God and prayer develops the power of God in our lives and prayer delivers us from the world, the flesh, and the devil. Then we started three weeks ago before our baptism Sunday to ask the question, well, how do we pray effectively? And we looked here in Matthew chapter 6, right, right before Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer, he, he teaches us and shows us how we should pray in, in the closet. We should pray in quiet. We should have our own personal time where we pray and where we talk to the Lord. Man, that is so important for Christians every day to pray, to draw closer to God and have a secret place where you meet with the Lord on your own. Last week, we began studying the Lord's Prayer and the model that Jesus gives us, asking that same question, okay, well, how does Jesus teach us to pray? And we were reminded that, number one, who we're praying to, he's our Heavenly Father. He loves us. He has a paternal love for each and every one of you this morning. He knows who you are. He knows what you're going through. He sees what you're facing even right now, and he loves you and wants to work in your life. He's our Heavenly Father. We were reminded that He's a holy God, that when we pray, we should praise His name. And before we get in there and take time to just give our laundry list of things that we want or we need, to take time to just praise the name of Jesus. In your car, to just worship Him. In your own quiet time, just to worship Him. To thank Him for the good things that you have in your life. It's so easy to focus on the negative until you really put things into perspective, right? We're so quick to complain. Even me, a silly illustration, but complaining about the weather. And uh, Brother Matt says, well, in India, it's a lot warmer than this. This is cool. Puts into perspective for me to stop complaining. God is good. God, God has done so, many good, so much good things in our lives. And to praise him and to thank him and to give him, uh, show him a heart of gratitude. We were reminded that we should be surrendered and yielded for God's will to be done in our lives. To trust Him with the outcome. It might not be how we think it should happen, but Lord, I trust you with the outcome. I'm asking you to do this. I'm asking you to work here. But either way, I'm, I, I'm sold out to you. I'm trusting you. Now this morning, we'll finish that second half of the Lord's Prayer. And answering this question, how do we pray? Look at verse 11 as Jesus continues to go on here in Matthew chapter 6. And what does he say? He says, give us this day our daily bread. Now for the first time in this whole model prayer, Jesus finally, our ghost gets to the, to the area where we are to ask him of things. And we think in our mind that's just how we pray, just asking God, asking God, asking God. And that's not bad. The Lord wants us to ask. The Lord wants us to work. But it's interesting that it was several verses in before we get to this point. But I want to break this down and pull this apart here for a moment. Give us this day our daily bread. Listen, believer, we must recognize that we are totally dependent on the Lord for life and all of its necessities. And we must trust him. Ready? Don't miss this. We must trust him to provide for us without worrying. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 through 26, you can look right over a few verses down, says, Therefore I say unto you, here's Jesus still uh, preaching and teaching, he says, Take no thought for your life, and don't be anxious. What shall ye eat, or what shall you drink? Nor yet for your body, what shall you put on? Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold, the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Jesus is saying, hey, don't be anxious for your day-to-day -day needs. What are you going to eat? What are you going to wear? Don't be anxious and worried. You can be dependent on me as your heavenly Father to meet your needs, to provide for you. 
And so I think in context, in my own opinion, this verse has really two separate meanings. Yes, one on the literal physical sense, to be dependent on God for our daily needs. To ask God to provide and to work and to give us wisdom in our financial decisions and in our day-to-day decisions to provide for our family and to do what we need to do to make ends meet. To realize and rely on Him totally that we're dependent on God for these things. I think also, though, on the other hand, yes, physically speaking, but I also believe spiritually speaking, Jesus is teaching us here. Give us this day our daily bread. Yes, that's food, so we think obviously physical, and I believe that, but I think in a sense he's also saying, listen, we must be dependent on him for the spiritual things we need to make it every single day. For the spiritual strength to continue growing in my relationship with God. For the strength to win the spiritual battles that we're facing in life. For the desires and discipline to live in God's word and maintain that strong, passionate relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus reminds us in 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 this model of prayer, first go to God humbly and recognize everything is sustained by him. Colossians says, by him all things consist. And then going to God and asking him and trusting him to provide that daily bread you need to make it in this life, both physically and spiritually. If I can summarize all of that with just a phrase, it would be this. Be completely dependent on God for everything in your life. And you know that when you pray and when you talk to the Lord, that's what you're showing God. That's what you're acknowledging God I can't get through this life and do these things on my own. I'm dependent on you. And you know what we're showing the Lord when we don't pray? I don't need you, God. I can do this on my own. I can figure this out. I can navigate this life on my own. I can make these decisions. I know I'm going through a hard time, but I'll just figure it out. Can I tell you, believer, I've been there. It's a very scary place to live. And so this can fall under one of the categories or one of the answers of why it's important to pray because when we pray, we're showing God we're totally dependent on Him. And that's where we want to live as believers. Totally dependent on God. God, I'm dependent on you for my financial decisions, for feeding my family, for providing for my family. I don't want to get so caught up in the luxuries and the riches of this world. I want everything to be in moderation, and I want, yes, you'll bless and you'll take care of me, but I don't want to get so caught up in that stuff. I want to trust you with it. You'll give me what I need to give my family a good life and to provide, but also uh, I'm spiritually speaking, I'm dependent on you, God. God, I'm coming to you in prayer today and I'm asking you to give me the strength to even make it through this day. I don't feel like I can go on anymore. I feel broken. I feel down. I feel depressed. I feel dark. I feel, I feel discouraged. Lord, I need your strength and help to allow me to make it through this day. Showing God, Jesus says, give me this day our daily bread. Showing God, I, I need you. I'm dependent totally on you. And the Bible teaches that, as I said, everything how we breathe, the sun going up, the earth rotating. It's all under the control of our Heavenly Father. And I think where we get away from the Lord and where our world gets away from God is we think we don't need the Lord and we depend on ourselves, on our cleverness, on our, on our pride, on our talents that we think. But the sooner we humble ourselves and figure out what John fifteen five says, which is this, Jesus is speaking, he says this, for without me... Ye can do nothing. For without me, ye can do nothing. The sooner we humble ourselves and figure that out, the better off we'll be. Humble ourselves and say, Lord, I can't get through this without you. I can't even make this small decision without you. God, I want to be totally dependent on you in my marriage, in my child rearing, in my finances, in my day-to-day decisions, in my personal battles, in the sins I struggle with to get victory. I don't want to be in navigating this life on my own. And so I pray and I come to you to show I'm totally dependent on you. Believer, that's why we, one of the main reasons why we pray, to put dependence on God. He says, be anxious for nothing in Philippians. Trust the Lord. You know when we start to live in a place of anxiety and fear and discouragement and darkness, and I've been there, is when we start to get away from the Lord. When I let my problems just overwhelm me, that I look back and I say, man, it's been a week and this week has been crazy and I haven't even opened my Bible and prayed once 
I haven't talked to the Lord once. I haven't even gone to the Lord and said, God, give me wisdom with this. I'm just trying to figure it out on my own. And that's where anxiety sets in and loneliness sets in. But the minute as Catherine sang that song a few weeks ago, I run to the Father and I fall into his arms and and I bend the knee and I say, God, I need you. I'm totally dependent on you. A calmness and a peace comes in my life. says, Zach, I got you. I'll guide you. I'll lead you. But you got to come to me. You got to trust me. And Christian believer, that's where we need to live. Jesus says, verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Give us what we need, Lord, to get through this day. Physically, spiritually, I'm totally dependent on you. We are totally dependent on God, and God wants us to be aware of that. We depend on him for the next breath we take, for the sun to rise tomorrow, for him to to keep his word as we know it in existence. Acts 17, 28 says this, for in him we live and move and have our being. For in him we live. For in him we have our being. It's only the mercy of God that we're even here this morning. It's only the mercy of God that we get to come to church. It's only the mercy of God that we have the word of God on our our laps and that we're not banished to hell for all of eternity. Only by the mercy of God that we're even here and that he loves us. Acknowledge that, believer. And when you pray and have a life of prayer, you are acknowledging that. You're acknowledging your dependence on God. Next, he says in verse 12, chapter 6, give us this day our daily bread and then, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, debts, and you can study this later or you just take my word for it, means sins. It says, forgive us our sins and forgive us our debtors. So, Jesus is teaching us to ask the Lord for forgiveness of our daily sins. Now, stick with me for just a moment because I think this is important to understand and comprehend You say, well, why do I daily need to come to the Lord and ask forgiveness for my sins? I thought that once I put my faith in Jesus Christ and I become a believer, my sins are forgiven. I have a home in heaven one day. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside my heart. That's 100% true that your sins are forgiven. So then why is Jesus saying daily that I need to do that? Because listen, when you are saved, your position in Christ is, changes right you were, you were dying you were going to hell now your position is a home in heaven you can't lose that nothing will take that away from you your position in christ never will change once you put your faith in him and praise the lord for that praise the lord for eternal security that the scripture teaches us that no man can pluck us out of the father's hand that when we come to the lord humble and broken and put our faith in him our position is now in him and we have a promised home in heaven and a relationship with him on earth and that cannot change But what does change is not our position, is ready, catch this, our condition. Our daily condition changes. Because even though our position is in Christ, once we're a believer and we're saved, we still sin. We still mess up. I don't know about you, but at least me. Every single day we mess up. Every single day we sin. So we can't lose our salvation. Our position doesn't change, but our condition changes. And what happens when we allow sin to just have reign in our lives and just to take over? Do you believe that you're going to lose your salvation? I don't, and I believe I can show you from the Bible why. That's another lesson. That's another topic, another time. But I believe that when you allow sin to reign in your life and you fall away from God, your relationship with the Lord is strained. Your relationship with God is is broken. Because you're allowing sin to reign on the throne of your heart rather than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus says here, forgive us our debts, what is he saying? He says, come daily in your prayer and confess your sins. You don't have to confess them to go to heaven because you're already saved. Your position is there. But confess them so there's nothing between you and the Savior. Confess them to make things right between you and the Lord. A repeated request for forgiveness is not required For salvation in this sense. But a daily prayer that God would forgive us our debts is not necessary for salvation or justification, but instead in an aspect of the continuing process of sanctification. I don't want to get too heavy here with Bible teaching and doctrine. I'm going to be quick, but I want you to understand this because this is important. When you're saved, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, what happens? All the legal work is done, right? Your your payment for sin, the payment for sin is paid. You put your faith in Christ. That Bible word is justification. 
So all the things that needed to happen for you in order to be saved, Jesus died on the cross, you put your faith in him, the payment had to be made, all of that legal work had to take place. It'd be like buying a house, closing on a house when the attorney comes in and has you sign all these legal uh, paperwork to sign your life away to this house. It's the same idea, justification, all the legal work was done. And it's done. It's finished. You're a believer. That won't change. But sanctification is once we're saved, is that process we go through every day in our Christian life, becoming more like Jesus Christ, becoming a more mature believer. And if we're going to grow in our faith and become a more mature believer, here's the thought, we can't have sin in our lives. We can't live a life of, of pride and lust and immorality and addiction because it's going to break up our relationship with the Lord. And so when Jesus teaches us here when we pray to uh, forgive us our debts, he's saying when you come to God in prayer, confess your sins, not so that you can go to heaven. That's already been settled if you're a believer, but so your relationship with Jesus Christ can be strong and intact. And as the old hymn says, nothing is between you and your Savior. And so when I come to the Lord in prayer, I need the Lord to be close to me. I need the Lord to work in my life. I don't want anything to be between me and the Savior. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so these, flat, these last two verses we looked at, we see, number one, Jesus teaches in prayer to ask and depend totally on God. Then he teaches in prayer to confess your sins. Make sure there's nothing that hinders your relationship with the Lord. And this morning, if you're living in sin or you're going down a path you know that you shouldn't be going down and you're a saved believer of Jesus Christ, make it right with the Lord today. We can't afford to go through this life with a strained relationship with the Lord. We can't afford to navigate this life with a broken relationship with God. We must be in tune with the Lord and in tune with the Holy Spirit. But he noticed what he says at the end of verse uh, 12 there. He says... As we forgive our debtors. Now that's interesting, and this could be a whole sermon in itself, but we'll just spend a minute here. What is Jesus saying? So confess your sins, but also giving us a principle to forgive other people who have wronged us in our lives. It's interesting, and Jesus kind of just throws that in there, because that's a very hard thing to do. Those who've wronged us, it's totally against our nature to forgive them. But if we're going to become more like Christ and grow in our faith, we must ask the Lord to give us the faith, love, and mercy to forgive those who have hurt and harmed us in our lives. And I believe Jesus puts it here in the Lord's Prayer because you know where that spirit of forgiveness is cultivated? In prayer. When you pray and you talk to the Lord and you're confessing your sins and you're asking God to work in your life and you're praising his name, the Lord is working on your heart and he re realized there's some resentment in your life. There's some bitterness in your life. There's a grudge that you're holding in your life and it's keeping you from taking the next step in your faith. And so many times bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness, it hurts us a lot more than the person that we have the grudge against because it keeps us from growing. It keeps us from moving on for the Lord. And man, there's such a weight that's lifted off your shoulders when you can come to the point when you can just forgive that person. I don't know. I know in, in, a, in a room this size and people watching through live stream that I'm sure all of us could testify that people have wronged us in our lives. And trust me when I tell you, by personal illustration, it can be very hard to forgive. But if we're going to move on and become more like Christ and, and really live a, a life of prayer, as Christians, we need to learn to forgive. And if for no other reason... Because where would we be if God didn't forgive us? If God didn't forgive me and you, we wouldn't be here today. And so God sets the ultimate example, say, listen, if I can forgive the whole world for the sin and the hate and the evil and the darkness and the immorality and how they reject me and how they curse my name and all those things, then yes, no matter how terrible it may seem or be, you can forgive that person in your life that's wronged you. And it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. But that spirit is cultivated in a prayer, and I believe Jesus puts it there, not by accident. Verse 13, let's look at Matthew 6, 13. He says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We get to the concluding verse where Jesus says to pray that we be led not into temptation and delivered from evil. Now, I don't believe that we're, we're, 
we're taught here to pray against testings because God tests us in our life. He tests our faith. Never test us to sin. God will never tempt you to sin. Never. But he will test your faith just like he did Abraham when he brought his son to the altar and was going to sacrifice him. He'll test your faith. And there's example after example in the Bible. And when God, if God is putting through a testing right now, you trust him. He's working in your life. But what he's saying here is not asking for God not to test you and to increase your faith, but specifically for temptation, for evil. This is a petition that the children of God pray, not that they may be kept from every occasion, uh, that they may be kept, I'm sorry, from every occasion an object of sinning, from those sins that we're most inclined to, that God will not leave them to Satan and the world and the flesh, to have a spiritual hedge of protection. Oftentimes in my prayer, that's what I pray. Oftentimes you hear me on Sunday mornings, I put a spiritual hedge of protection around this church, around these people. Why? Because there's a spiritual warfare that takes place. There's a spiritual battle that takes place. And I can speak just from, uh, from personal illustration. I'm sure many of you can attest, some of you I talk to so I know, but the last several weeks, and even this week in my own personal life, if I told you some of the things that I feel the devil's thrown my way to discourage me, you wouldn't even believe you think I'm making it up if I told you the whole story. And I totally believe that it's a spiritual warfare. It's an attack. You think this morning, stick with me, you think this morning that the enemy and the rulers and the darkness and the evil in this world wants a New Testament church that preaches the gospel to take root in Newtown, Connecticut? Not a chance. You think the enemy wants to see lives changed and marriages helped and prodigals returned and Christians growing and children growing up with godly desires from the word of God and addicts restored and chains of sin and self broken and people coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. And so he's going to do everything he can to put up a fight. He's going to do everything he can when people try to move forward for God and take root for God to discourage, to destroy, to attack. And it's important as believers we understand we're not here on some spiritual playground, but we are on a spiritual battleground this morning. And how do we fight that battle? How do we fight that battle? How do, how, how do we trust the Lord? How do we get through those seasons? Prayer. Prayer. Being totally dependent on God. Saying, God, I can't get through this on my own. I can't fight the enemy on my own. We need you, Lord. Why? Because the Bible says this, greater is he that is in you, talking about Jesus Christ, than he that is in the world, talking about the devil. We serve an all-powerful, all-knowing God. And as much darkness and evil as may reign in this world, in this, in, in this state, in this town, and all the evil and wickedness that goes on in our culture today, God is greater than all of it. We're not going to defeat it on our own. We're not going to overcome it on our own. We must cling to Jesus Christ and trust him for spiritual protection. And we do that in prayer. And by the way, I think that Jesus is teaching us here not just to pray for our own spiritual protection and for God to guide and protect us spiritually as we try to move forward in our faith and move forward as a church, but he's also giving us the example to pray for each other, to intercede. So this is the model prayer, right? So yes, we ask for our daily needs. We confess our sins. And then when we come down to the very end, we ask the Lord to put a spiritual hedge of protection around our lives, around our families, around those we love, around our friends, around our church. Christian, the best thing you can do for the person sitting in front of you or next to you is pray for them. The best thing you can do for anyone that walks through the doors of this church is pray for them. I had a man say to me this week who comes to our church, not here this morning, he said, you know what, Pastor, before the church started and I wasn't coming to church, I felt like things were a lot easier. <laughs> I come to church now and I just feel like it's, it's a fight just to get up. It's a fight to be here. It's a fight to be in church, but I'm also seeing what God's doing in my life and I'm seeing how God is helping my kids and how God has strengthened my marriage. And so I'm thankful for that and I see how God is working, but I also notice as I try to draw closer to God and take that next step in my faith, the attacks and the assault from the enemy just keeps coming and coming and coming. And Christian, we fight that battle in prayer. And Jesus says here to pray that you'd lead us not into temptation, to deliver us from evil. 
We stand no chance in this world on our own. We must get a hold of God for our families. We must get a hold of God for our children. We must get a hold of God for our church, for our community, to ask God to put a spiritual hedge of protection from the evils of this world and for the love of Christ and his gospel message to prevail in our church, in our community, and in our lives. We must, we must, we must pray. And I'll, I'll say this, and I'm, I'm just about done. There's no doubt in my mind, as I mentioned before, that the enemy does not like what's going on here in our church. Just little things this week. Little things. Just to, that you feel like Satan's just, just like a sucker punch. There's big things, no doubt. Trust me, there's big things and there's little things. This guy put a sign here that I can't park down here. <laughs> little things. Just to, to discourage, to attack. Just to, 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 to discourage you, think, why am I even doing this? Why are we even doing this? Why don't we just quit? This is more, this is more headache, these thoughts that, that come in your mind, and you realize and acknowledge it's a spiritual warfare. It's a spiritual attack, and I need to live in prayer. I need to trust the Lord. God, I can't get through this on my own. I can't get through this life on my own. Lord, I pray that you be with the families in our church. Strengthen the marriages. Strengthen our children. Give us victory over sin. Help us to get serious about our faith. Help us stop playing games with you. Help us to draw closer to you. And Lord, help us to be prayer warriors. And through that whole model prayer there, we see what? Very simple, few five words. When you pray, make sure you praise the Lord. Praise him, worship him. When you talk to the Lord, make sure you say, I'm yielded, I'm yielded to you, God, I'm surrendered to you. When you pray, make sure, yes, you ask the Lord for what you need physically and spiritually and show him you're totally dependent on him. Make sure you confess. Confess your sins. Make sure there's nothing between you and the Savior. Lord, I know I'm not perfect and I mess up every single day and I'm sorry. I'm for, I forgive me. I know you're faithful and just to forgive me of my sins, to cleanse me from unrighteousness, as your word says, and give me the victory to overcome these sins in my life. And then lastly, intercession. Pray for your family. Pray for others. Pray for your church. Hey, New Heights Baptist Church, let's get serious about this thing of prayer. Let's get serious about getting a hold of God. God responds to prayer. The hand of God moves when believers pray and are totally dependent on him. I'll end with this. After church, we have the balcony prayer meeting that the ladies in our church put together, and there's maybe five or six people up there on, a, on, a, on an average a Sunday, and I noticed the list that they were praying for and the things they pray for specifically. And it's amazing to see in a 10, 15 minute prayer meeting over the last two months how a lot of those things just were just checking off that God's doing. And you're not going to tell me that's coincidence or accidents. That's a result of God hearing some humble servants in a balcony taking time to say, God, we need you in our church and families and husbands and wives. We need God in our families and our communities and our children. We must, we must, we must pray. We must pray. Man, I don't know about you, but if anything this week, may we be challenged to get in the secret place to get a hold of God, to praise his name, to yield to him, to ask and be totally dependent on him, to confess and to intercede for others. And when you live there on a daily basis, you're going to see God start to deliver you, protect you, and work in your life in a powerful way. Because at the end of this day, without God, this is a dark, hopeless world. But with God, and because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have hope, we can have victory, we can have peace in our lives. May all of us be challenged this week and the rest of our lives as we grow in our faith to be prayer warriors.